Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Um, if you want to use your uh, Bible, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 6. The sermon text is also printed for you as an insert into what you received today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your mercy to us as sinners. We're aware that we have not honored you and loved you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength this morning. And so we're always in need of your grace through Jesus. We thank you also for your spirits renewing and empowering work. We thank you for giving new hearts to those who are trusting in Jesus here, causing us to even trust you, and that you've opened our eyes to see your beauty in Jesus. We pray that if there's anyone here who you've not done that to yet, that you would do it even this morning. Open their eyes to see who you really are, to receive your forgiveness because of the cross of Jesus, and to receive the Holy Spirit in new life. We pray that you would encourage and convict and challenge and comfort those who need each or all of those this morning for your word. In Jesus' name. Well, someone once wrote that what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So how do you view God? Do you tend to view God as if he is an aloof and stern prison warden or something like that? So you're in jail, we're in jail, and he basically doesn't really care. Uh, But the best we can do is there's occasions where we can kind of show that we're on our best behavior so he doesn't revoke privileges. But what if God is more like a generous king who gladly invites us to his table for a meal? And he is the host, and we who are invited, we actually do deserve to be in prison. But instead, we're welcomed into his palace for a royal feast. Well, these two different views of God and various similar kinds of views that people can have and we can have, create two very different ways of living in the world. One way leads us to feel alone and neglected and scraping by. The other way leads to a life of contentment, thankfulness, joy, knowing that we're cared for by the God who made us and we enjoy his grace and his blessings. Well, Leviticus is here in the Bible, to show us that God wants us to know him as the host of a royal feast. This is what the offerings and sacrifices in Leviticus that we've been looking at for a few weeks are ultimately about. Now, before we see that from the text this morning, I want to note a couple reasons why we may miss this from the text we're going to look at this morning about these sacrifices and offerings in this system related to the tabernacle. Well, two reasons. One is because we often miss the importance of what shared meals are about. They're not very important in our culture. Now, that's not to say that food is not important in our culture. Some count and regulate every bit of food that goes into their bodies. Others jump from diet to diet to diet. Other people eat and overeat without a concern. Food is very important in our culture. But shared meals are not. We often eat alone or on the go or in front of a show. But that's not how it is in most cultures, either ancient or modern. If someone invited you to sit around the table, it was an important act of friendship. And because we miss this, we miss how God uses meals to teach us what he's really like and what salvation itself is actually all about. Second, we don't usually think of the sacrifices and offerings in the Old Testament as meals. Many modern people think of Old Testament religion as kind of bizarre, archaic, outdated. They view it as unenlightened humans manipulating a God to get him to do what we want. Do this ritual, offer this sacrifice, make it just right, and then the deities will unlock some blessings for you. In some ways, this is what pagan religions were doing. They sacrificed in order to manipulate the divine realm, to 
to bless them, like putting in the right amount in a vending machine, pressing the right number, and dispensing the blessing. But the rituals in Leviticus were not about manipulating the deity to get a blessing. They were about responding to a personal God's grace. And they were about enjoying his blessings. So we see this when we realize that the offerings themselves were ultimately shared meals. They were symbol-laden meals that portray God as a generous host. And so when God tells Israel to bring offerings to his presence, to his tabernacle, he's inviting them to dine with him. That's what the offerings were ultimately all about. So here's the context to remind us. Israel has come to Mount Sinai after being rescued from slavery. So God's rescued them by grace, and now he's called them to build this tent called a tabernacle. It's viewed as God's house, his dwelling. That's where the word tabernacle even comes from. God is their king, and the tabernacle is his palace. And so as people enter, they first come into the courtyard of this tabernacle palace. And that's where the offerings would, or the Israelites would bring their offerings. And the priests were allowed into the tent itself, which had two rooms. Inside that first room, the holy place, there's furniture, like a home. There's a dining table with bread. There's a lamp in there. And then the deepest part of the tent is the most holy place. And that was viewed as the throne room of the king, where God caused his special presence to dwell. So the tabernacle is to be viewed as the palace of God. It's the way that God would dwell with his people and they would all put their own tents around it in the wilderness, much like a traveling army would would set up their tents with the tent of the king at the center. So now that this tabernacle's set up, the book of Leviticus is answering this question. How can this holy king dwell in the midst of sinful people? And the first answer to the question is in the first seven chapters of the book, which is through the offerings and sacrifices. And these were viewed in large part as shared meals. They would be offered in the courtyard of this tabernacle palace, and they would be eaten there. And every week, what we're doing in the book of Leviticus is we're seeing how everything in Leviticus echoes Eden before it and points forward to Jesus and this new life he gives us in the future. So these offerings are enacting a drama as these Israelites would bring them and offer them and eat them. It's enacting the drama of how God is restoring the feast that we lost in Eden. It's as though God is inviting us back into his home, back into his royal presence in Eden again. And then this all points forward to Jesus who dies for our sins as a sacrifice, and then he himself invites us to experience salvation as a feast. And he ate with sinners when he was here, and he'll spread a feast for us in the new creation to come. We'll dwell with him forever. So the message of this text that we'll read here is this. Jesus is our royal host, and he invites us into his life by grace. So we spent the last two Sundays looking at five different offerings in the first five chapters of Leviticus. And now this morning, we're looking at chapters six and seven. And this goes over the same offerings, adding one, but now it's focusing on how the people, the priests and the people honor these offerings as meals in the house of God. So we'll walk through four kinds of meals together. A meal for God, a meal with priests, a meal with Israel, and a meal for us. What we'll do is instead of reading the whole text together at the front, like we usually do, we'll read large portions as we go. So first, the meal for God. This first section emphasizes that the smoke of the first offering called the burnt offering is to always continue to rise before God. So the focus here is on the burnt offerings that the priests would make morning and evening. Now, a couple weeks ago, when we looked at the burnt offerings that Israelites would bring, they could bring them whenever they wanted. But this is the kind of burnt offering that the priests would offer on behalf of the people every morning and every evening. And the emphasis here is how the priests were to keep that fire going 
moment by moment, 24-7, day and night. So this is verses 9 to 13. You can follow along as I read this. This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And he shall arrange the burnt offering on it and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. So in Exodus, God had instructed the priests to offer a lamb every morning and a lamb every evening as this burnt offering. They would offer it with bread and wine. So do you see how this is a complete meal? You have a lamb with bread and wine viewed as a meal, and then that whole meal was burned up completely. No one ate this offering. It was symbolically consumed by God. It was transformed into smoke right on the altar, and then the smoke rose as if symbolically to God's very presence. God, of course, does not literally eat it. That's not the point. It never was the point. The burnt offering was the foundational offering for Israel. The animal was sacrificed on it in the place of the people, and it communicated this. You deserve to die and should die. But this animal, this unblemished, costly animal, is going to die in your place so that you can live. And it pictured the acceptance of a person by grace. It also pictured the complete, perfect devotion of the offerer to God pictured in this perfect offering being offered to God, and it pictures being drawn near to God. So the priests would offer this each morning and each evening as representatives of the people, so on behalf of all the people. So in the morning, it's the foundational offering. In fact, this burnt offering that happened first in the morning was viewed as the foundational offering, and all the other offerings that Israelites would bring through the day were viewed as being placed on top of this one, kind of carried up in the smoke of the burnt offering. And then in the evening, this burnt offering would keep going through the whole night. So the emphasis here is on the priests needing to keep this fire going over and over in verses 9 and 12 and 13. It says, the fire of the altar shall be kept burning. God is being very clear about the emphasis here. Don't let the fire go out at night. The smoke should always be rising to God. So do you see what this is communicating? It's saying every moment of every day and every night, you have a burnt offering for you. You are a sinner and you should die. But the burnt offering is offered in your place and you are accepted by grace. It's a picture of your whole life also being offered perfectly and completely to God. Even when you're not thinking about it, even when you're sleeping, even when you're sinning, it said to the Israelites, the smoke of the burnt offering is rising for you. Some of you like to, who likes to smoke meat here? Okay, plenty. Uh, We just started doing this. We put uh, 14 pounds of pork on and continued to have it cooking at 300 degrees through the evening and the night and the morning. It was ready by the afternoon the next day. So, As that pork is being roasted and cooked, we went about our activities knowing that it was always roasting. So we would look at it, and there's the smoke rising. We'd check on it, and it was still hot. Even when we weren't thinking about it, even when we were sleeping, that was still roasting, and the smoke was still rising. It was still preparing a meal for us. We're doing nothing. But it's working for us, and so we're just grateful when we think about it. This is how the burnt offering worked. The smoke of it was always rising. Not a moment was to be missed. It was always for you, always providing your acceptance before God and always picturing on your behalf a perfect devotion to God 
through that offering. And God set up this offering for Israel to point forward to what Jesus would do for us. Jesus himself was sacrificed one time, once for all. That does not need to be repeated. But do you know what he's doing now? Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost, to the end, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus is interceding for us 24-7, and part of his work of intercession, it's pictured as him praying in the, in the, the smoke of his prayers rising before the Father 24-7, and part of what he's doing is he's applying his sacrifice to us. The once for all burnt offering of the cross is now applied to those who are trusting in him every single moment, even as you're not thinking about it, even when you're sleeping, even when you're sinning. Jesus is committed to making sure that our sins do not condemn us. That's what Christ's intercession is about. So when you trust in Christ, your sins are totally forgiven, but our hearts can then feel unforgiven and unaccepted later. That offering pictures a complete devotion. Jesus himself giving his righteousness, a complete devotion of a perfect human before God in our place. We're clothed with that perfect devotion and righteousness. But then we can feel at times unforgiven, unaccepted later. But the intercession of Jesus means that his atonement is always applied to you. The smoke of his offering is always rising. The intercession of Jesus is a neglected doctrine, but do you see how relevant this is to us every single moment? My favorite Puritan, Thomas Goodwin, put it like this. We owe our standing in grace every moment to his sitting in heaven and interceding every moment. So this is the meal for God. It's totally consumed by him, and the smoke of our acceptance continually rises before him. But now second, the meal with priests. The next offerings here are the grain offering, sin offering, and guilt offerings. These are meals that are shared between God and the priests. And the emphasis in this text, again, is not on just the general procedure, which is some of what we saw in previous weeks. The focus here is on the who, what, where, when, and how of the actual eating of the offering. So this is, these are viewed as meals between God and the priests. So the first shared meal is the grain offering. This begins in 14. Let's read this together. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. And one shall take from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering and its oil and all the frankincense that's on the grain offering and burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So that's the part that's burned. Verse 16, and the rest of it, Aaron and his sons shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my food offering. Notice that last line there. The Lord says that these are his food offerings. So this is his meal. And the grain offering is brought to God in his palace and then God, as it were, collects this grain offering, and then he invites the priests to sit at his table, and he spreads it out before them to join him in eating. And then they're to eat it in the courtyard, so in this palace complex. Another grain offering is the priesthood ordination offering. This is verses 19 to 23. This is a special offering when a new high priest is ordained to serve, and the focus is, is here is on how the priests don't get to eat any of this one. And then you have the sin or purification offering in verses 24 to 30 here. And this is the offering that people make when they have sinned in particular and are seeking forgiveness. The person would bring an animal, a particular one prescribed in previous uh, chapters. And unlike the burnt offering, this one is not all burned up. It's shared with the priests. So look at verses uh, 40, or 25 and 26. Speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten, in the court of the tent of meeting. So part of this is offered to the Lord, 
and then the rest of it's eaten by the priests. And again, this is not uh, for the priest to be able to take home. They don't kind of get to collect this, eat a snack there, package it up in their Tupperware, put it in their fridge when they get home, and then eat it over these next few weeks. This is supposed to be eaten in the courtyard. So God is hosting this meal in his home. And then the next one is the guilt or restitution offering. This is an offering Israel would bring if they committed particular kinds of sins that they were wronging from someone, and the net result is that they stole from somebody. They, they robbed something of some good. And so they would make restitution to that person, and then they offer this animal, making restitution and payment to God. And the emphasis again here is on who gets to eat this and where they're supposed to eat it. So this is chapter 7 and the first six verses. This is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the guilt offering. And its blood shall be thrown against the sides of the altar, cleansing it. And all its fat shall be offered. The fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests may eat it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. So the best part is offered to God, and then the priests eat the rest. And they eat it in the courtyard of the tabernacle, this palace of God. And then finally, we have this summary conclusion of all the offerings so far at the end here. The emphasis is on how these are a shared meal between God and the priests. And so Israel needs to make sure that they don't neglect giving the provisions for these offerings. So this is verses 7 to 10. The guilt offering is just like the sin offering. There's one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. And the priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he's offered. Verse 9, And every grain offering baked in the oven and all that's prepared on a pan or a griddle shall belong to the priest who offers it. And every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall be shared equally among the sons of Aaron. So these offerings are a way of supporting the priests. Israelites needed to make sure that they provide for the priests and these meals through their offerings. Now, we don't have official priests today, which is why we don't call leaders in our church priests. This is because this whole system is fulfilled in Jesus and, our, and his church. Jesus is our high priest. All those who trust Jesus are priests in him. Jesus is the true tabernacle and temple. All those united to Jesus by faith become part of this tabernacle and temple. But the principle here still applies. There are still leaders who work among the tabernacle temple of God. Paul draws on the very things that we're looking at here to explain how church leaders and missionaries, those who proclaim the gospel, should be supported financially. So I'll give one example here. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 to 14, he says this, and he's referencing texts like the one that we're looking at this morning. He says, Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar shall share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel shall get their living by the gospel. So just wanted to pause here to help you realize this is part of why we give to the local church. We should always keep looking to be reminded for the reasons why we give. We don't just kind of set up an automatic payment and forget about it. Uh, we don't just put an offering in the box and just say, well, we're just kind of supposed to do this. Jesus and Paul draw on this tabernacle temple system to explain why Christians give to the local church. It's so that we can free up people to give their lives to proclaim the gospel and serve among God's people and spread the gospel further for those who need to hear it so that we can provide for them to be freed up to do that with all their time. So they don't have to be burdened by a different job that would take all their time so they can't be freed up to do this. Of course, we're all called to proclaim the gospel. Uh, but there's a particular support given. So I just want to encourage you to remind you why you give, and I give as well. So obviously I'm part of one of the people who is supported by you, and I'm so grateful. 
And then I also am giving to the local church, Zionsville Fellowship and supporting other missionaries so that they can be freed up to serve in this way. So God's giving instruction about these shared meals between God and the priests, and he's ensuring that the people support their leaders in this way. So third, so we have the meal for God, the meal with the priests, now the meal with all Israel. The rest of the chapter, which is a lot left, focuses on only one offering. This is the peace offering. This is the meal that was shared between God and the priests and all the people. So the peace offering can be brought at any time, and there's typically three main reasons why someone would bring a peace offering. They can bring it as an expression of thanksgiving. So maybe the Lord rescued them in some way, delivered them in some way, and they want to express thankfulness to him. Or to reinforce a vow they've made. Or to, just because. They just want to do this. It's referred to as a free will offering. That's not talking about uh, some philosophical category of free will. It's just saying they can do it whenever they want of their own heart's desire, just because. So this is verses 11 to 16. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings that one may offer to the Lord. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, so that's the first reason, then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of leavened bread. And from it, he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood of the priest offering. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his offering, peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow offering or a free will offering, these other two reasons, he, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice and on the next day, what remains of it shall be eaten. Do you notice again, you know, if we just read this quickly in our, you know, Bible reading plan, if we've made it to this chapter in the plan and we haven't given up, we can just kind of be numbed by all the details. Like, okay, more offerings, more specific details. The priest does that. The person does that for this reason, that reason. But do you see the emphasis again is on the eating? The instructions are for how this needs to be eaten on the same day or the next day, depending on the reason. And I think part of the point is this. There's no taking this home to enjoy the leftovers. This would have been a special meal. Eating meat like this would have been very rare for many Israelites. For some of them, they would only have meat when they're invited to participate in a peace offering. And this is emphasizing here that even though this is so special and there's so much, and wouldn't it be great to just pack this up and enjoy it later, God is saying, no, this is eaten all on the day you offer it or the next day. Because the point is, this is an event. This is a meal in God's presence to be eaten right there, to be shared as a feast in the courtyard or, or around there of the king, of his palace. So the food is for the event alone. After God gives his instructions for who can eat the food, he then says, all who eat it must be ritually clean or pure, which we'll get into that in coming weeks. And they shouldn't eat the fat or the blood. And he specifies that the priests get the breast and one of the thighs. And that's specified not just to be arbitrary, like, okay, the priest gets the breast, gets the thigh, okay, moving on. No, it's making sure that Israel didn't just give the priests their scraps because they could be prone to do that. It's saying you make sure you give some of the best parts to the priest, and then you all get to enjoy the rest. God's people are to honor the leaders among them. The emphasis all through this is the who, the what, the when, and the where of the eating. So what's missing from this list of W words that we learn in second grade? Who, what, when, where, why? That's actually the hardest part of reading Leviticus. The why is often assumed or inferred from other parts or like we're doing throughout this series, setting it in the context of the whole Bible so that we can understand the why. Well, why is eating the offering so important? And why all the details? It's because the goal of salvation itself is represented by this meal. Meals represent friendship and family 
and fellowship. Meals represent the commitment of relationship. These offerings were different than what the pagan cultures around them were doing in the ancient world in situations that might look similar to this with temples and offerings. This is not about manipulating the deities like a vending machine, performing your rituals like magic and unlocking the blessings from heaven. No, this is about the one true God, the maker of all things, who rescued his people from slavery, and he defines their relationship in terms of a father with children and a king with his people. And then he came to dwell with them. He's their rescuing and gracious king, and then he has them set up this tabernacle palace so he can dwell among them. And then he invites his people to find total forgiveness and fellowship. The goal of atonement and sacrifice is ultimately a meal, a feast with God and his people. That's the point. This is the meal with God. So finally, the meal with us. All of this was given to Israel as a real experience with God. I know I'm saying week after week that all of this was symbolic, and I just want to be clear. What I don't mean by that is it, it wasn't real. It was real, but it was temporary, and it was pointing toward the fullest fulfillment of what was to come. God's presence was real there. He really forgave those who offered in faith by virtue of the fact that they were pointing forward to the coming of Jesus. But it was deeply symbol-laden. God set up this whole system to point forward to and anticipate and teach about ahead of time Jesus. Jesus came as the presence of God among us. He came as the true king. And what did he do when he was here? What does it look like when this God of Leviticus shows up in human form as a human? Well, Jesus had a lot of meals. And not just to nourish himself, but he had meals with people because he was showing them what salvation looks like and giving people a taste of the whole point of what it means to be saved. When he fed the thousands, he was their host and he was giving them a banquet in the wilderness, just like God is doing here. And then on the night before he died, he was the divine host of the Last Supper. He said that he would be the sacrifice, his body and blood represented with the bread and wine. And then the next day he gave himself as the sacrifice on the cross. So we deserve to die, but he is the lamb of God, the burnt offering, the sin and guilt offering who takes away the sin of the world. And he did it so that now the smoke of the burnt offering of the cross can always rise through his intercession on our behalf. He always lives to make intercession for us so that our acceptance before God cannot be threatened by our fickleness, foolishness, and even sin. But we're always accepted by him as we lean on him and come to the Father through him. And he did this so that we could be accepted around his table forever. Did you know that the new creation in Revelation is described as a cosmic tabernacle? the cosmic holy of holies. The point is that in the new creation, we'll be let in. God will be with us. God will restore the feast that we lost in Eden. And Revelation 19 shows us where history is headed. Hallelujah for the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Why? For the marriage of the lamb has come. The, the marriage union between Jesus and his people. And what happens after weddings? A feast. Celebration. It says, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. History will culminate with the joy of a royal feast in God's presence. All by grace. So what does Leviticus mean for us today then? Well, it gives us an alternative to the never-satisfying worship of our modern age. The tabernacle and the sacrifices were contrasts to the pagan cultures of the ancient world. And that contrast back then is very relevant for how we understand the contrast of Jesus and the cultures 
that continue in this world. So in the ancient world, people created temples and they would personify the gods and the forces of nature that they couldn't control. They would personify them as little idols and images. And then they would feed those idols and they'd sacrifice to appease and manipulate them. So the gods were like aloof, fickle, demanding prison wardens. We're here in this prison. And so you sacrifice and you negotiate to get time off or better privileges or get out of solitary confinement or make sure they're reigning to supply your crops. The offerings of Leviticus are a direct and stark contrast to that. God came to rescue his people from slavery by grace. He's their father and their king. And he says, you can't manipulate me. You can have nothing to offer me that I need. Everything that you bring to me, I've given you first. And I have what you need. A sacrifice will take your place. And I'm going to set up all of these sacrifices that you bring from all the bounty that I've given you in order to teach you about the ultimate sacrifice that I myself will provide for you. in God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm your king and I'm your host. And the goal of that sacrifice is not just for you to be kind of go on your way with this abstract idea of forgiveness, but for you to come into my courtyard, come into my home, my palace, and belong there as my, not just servant of a king, but my friend, son or daughter. And I'm going to give you a feast. Invite your friends. In a similar way, Jesus contrasts with our modern culture. In a similar way that Leviticus and these sacrifices were contrasting with the ancient pagan culture. You know, the ancient world's idolatry and sacrifices, they're not really that different than today. We think we've left that behind, but we've just modernized it. There's modern versions of the same kind of dynamic. If you want a clear example of this, this afternoon, watch the five-minute video that Apple released this last week. Apple is the epitome of intellectual, beautiful, technological advance. If you want an example of something that's moved far beyond the ancient pagan cultures, temple worship, look to Apple, right? And they just released a video that captures how this ancient dynamic is actually still at work today. So the leaders of Apple are gathered in a boardroom and Mother Nature comes in in the image of a woman. And she has demands and expectations about their company, expectations about carbon emissions and being green and using recycled metals and planting trees. The leaders did their best to show their righteousness. Mother Nature was skeptical. She tried to find any way that they've slipped up like all the other companies are slipping up according to her, but they proved that they meet her standards. Finally, in the end, she says, okay, good. See you next year. So they, and they were relieved and they, they measured up. Mother Nature is happy with them and will bless them. But of course, she'll be back next year because it's never enough. This is the religious impulse that is deep within humanity. Of course, the leaders of Apple don't actually think that Mother Nature can be personified as a woman. And so in one sense, it's, they're trying to be comedic at some level, but it's, it's morality is what they're doing. And they really are better than they know expressing what's really going on in our culture right now and the religious impulse of our culture. Now, and I want to be clear, what I'm, I'm not saying that what Apple is doing to help the environment isn't good. I think creation care is a Christian value. And we must not react to things like this and say that that's ridiculous. It's important. God has created the world and given it to humanity to be stewards of. So there's things that we can do and it's important. But I'm saying what they're doing is what the ancient pagan religions did. They personify the forces that are beyond our control and that scare us as human, and then they made sacrifices to appease this God. They did all they could to measure up to the demanding God of Mother Nature. And of course, there's layers here 
that aren't even portrayed in this video because what they're doing is they're trying to appease our culture, you and I, because they don't want to get canceled. And they're really serving money because they really want us to buy their products. And they want us to be able to virtue our righteousness to the world when we buy their products and say, see, I'm green too. Because this is the religious impulse. We just have different gods, different uh, righteousness that, that's a fad right now. And we're trying to make sure we're on the good side of the gods we worship. Every culture has ultimate values that they sacrifice for. If you want to know what those values are, you just look at what people are sacrificing for. What do they give their time for? What do they offer their children in the womb for? What are they sacrificing their money for? Where are they spending their time and energy? We don't have to try to prove to Mother Nature that we mean it because it would never be enough for her and for any God or for the culture. We don't have to find our righteousness in how well we do creation care or in what diet we follow or in what justice cause we promote heavily on social media or in how we vote. We don't need to fit in with the new fads of self-righteousness in our culture or the fear of cancellation for not being a good person according to how our culture defines what a good person is right now. We can find our whole righteousness and acceptance and welcome through Jesus. We receive his sacrifice. We know that the fragrance of his offering is always rising for our acceptance. We receive his hospitality and his welcome into his life. We draw near to him in thankfulness and with devotion. And now having that, we live for the good of others. In some ways, it'll match what our culture might think is good, creation care being one of them. In some ways, it won't match because the culture's not focusing on everything they should. So we're going to live out with joyful, glad obedience to God out of the thankfulness that we have in our hearts from his acceptance. So the next meal you have, or in fact, just grab coffee and donuts. Uh, and the next meal you have, and then every meal after that, let it be a reminder of who God really is and what he's really like. He is a king who invites us to his table by grace. And like those peace offerings for Israel, you bring it, you're not going to eat that whole animal. You've got to bring your family and friends. And so there's a missional impulse here. God is saying, come to the table, come join me, join the feast, and the wedding supper will be served one day. Enjoy this. And don't keep this to yourself. Invite your friends. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the wonder of life, the wonder of reality, the wonder of who you are in all your glories. We thank you that you display your radiant beauty in what may seem to us at first like ancient and obscure texts like Leviticus 6 and 7. So we thank you for giving us understanding this morning. We thank you for the way that you display your beauty in Jesus here and welcome us and invite us to come to you. And so we pray now that we would draw near to you with full assurance of faith, with gratefulness for our glad acceptance to enjoy the feast at your table and to look forward to the new creation that will feast in your presence forever. And we pray for anyone here who senses that they need this kind of peace and calm of being accepted by you. Not a fickle prison warden, but a gracious father in heaven. We pray that they would draw near to you even right now, confessing their sins, receiving forgiveness, coming around your table. pray this in Jesus.